Hey, we're here at Tales and Scales in Canada, and uh, they're just getting packed up for the show that we're going to tomorrow. But we're stopping by to check out their store, so let's go take a look. Whoop, whoop. So this is an actual open running store right now. So we're kind of, you know, shooting in and out of uh, the customers coming through. It's actually really busy, which is awesome. Uh, we love to see reptile stores or pet stores in general doing well. So we're gonna look around and see some cool animals. If you want to start with some of the more simpler guys, we've got the super red cherry shrimp. They are raised in fresh water. Um, they're not in reverse os osmosis or anything like that. And pretty much, like, they're a very hardy little fish. I keep them in a very densely planted tank mostly. They're really good little scavengers. They're going to get their little hands in between all those nooks and crannies. And they're a good cleanup crew. Um, the females, when they're gravid, the very back of their tail there are going to have little yellow eggs. Okay. And she will be fanning those over the next couple of weeks to keep them clean. And then when she releases them, these shrimp are really good parents. Right. So the reds, the blues, all very similar. Um, good parents. They'll usually stash the babies in like a little hide somewhere and you'll see them walk around and that's pretty much how they raise up. These guys down here are crystals. So these are locally bred from a gentleman um, that frequents us here. And he's got these guys raising in RO water. So their pH is very, very neutral. It's right in the middle there. These are the crystal reds. There's a couple different types in here as well. There's black crystals. There's some that kind of resemble King Kongs. This is a little more of an intermediate shrimp compared to these guys up here. So your water quality has to be a little more watched and yeah, just good little cleanup crew. <laughs> And there are also, we have a couple other types of shrimp here too. They're called the mono shrimp. Mono and they're one of the best algae cleanup crews I would ever recommend. Okay. Next to your Siamese algae eating fish or your Indian eaters. So these shrimp here, if you take a look at all these plants, all of these plants were actually covered in algae a couple weeks ago. I threw them all in and now you can see not a single piece of algae left. So if you take a look on that <laughs> little plant there, You'll see they're kind of like clear. They've got little spots on them. Mine at home are about two inches. So they get very big mm -hmm. for the shrimp that they are. And they'll get a really deep color too. They'll get a little more dark and blue, which is really nice. And they're boisterous, so I wouldn't keep them with other shrimp. They will bully them and try to pull them apart. Okay. <laughs> so they're really good on their own, but it's a really good combo to do a mono shrimp and meteorite snails together to combat algae. Gotcha. If you don't want to get like a big fish or something like that. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks. I've been yeah, wanting to learn sure. about the shrimp for a long time. So that's cool. <laughs> All right, so we're uh, checking out some of the reptiles. They have a lot of really cool reptiles. And what's your name? Stella. Stella, here at Tails and Scales. Um, what do you got there? Here I have a Fiji iguana. Um, these guys are from Fiji Islands. Uh, they're vegetarians. Um, Full vegetarian? Yes. Um, and these guys are really cool. They're really hard to come by. Uh, yeah, for us, we, we can't keep them. Um, and it's just amazing to see these. I know that they're not like the most impressive lizard in the world or anything like that, but for us, this is one of those ones that you're like, you just can't ever see in real life. And here's one, and look, I'm touching it. <laughs> like, it's like one of those things, you know, like. Now you're not allowed back in America. Yeah. 
That's awesome. They are very beautiful. Super yeah. beautiful animals. These guys are also really expensive, um, so they will cost you pretty penny wherever you okay. are. Okay. Yeah. So like twenty five hundred bucks. Yeah. Um, males are fifteen hundred. Females go for twenty five hundred. Twenty five hundred bucks, and that's in can Canadian money, is that? Yes. So it's even so more in America. So. Even more in America. Yeah. Oh. Well, it'd be very expensive in America because it's like impossible to get. Yeah. But here in Canada, you can get them. This is just crazy. Yeah. It's a beautiful animal. Thanks, Stella. Too late. Missed the shot. <laughs> it's really cool here. It's a lot of fish. They, they sell a lot of plants, um, aquatic plants. So, Kai, you're really missing out. Uh, <laughs> we should probably. There's so many things we want to buy, but we can't bring it home, so. That's the way it is. My name is MJ. Hi, everybody. Hi, Hi MJ. World. What was your name? Ben. Ben, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And that's Ryan behind the camera. Hey, Ryan. Hi. Hi. Thanks for coming by, guys. So, really, really common fish you're always going to see out and about is obviously going to be your Siamese fighter fish or your bettas or betas, tomato, tomato. Um, misconceptions about this fish they can live in tiny cups without filtration. That is not true. If you go to a Pet Smart or something like that, you are going to see them in those cups. Mm -hmm. With us here, we want to keep them in obviously tanks. These are 2.5 gallons. They could be very comfortable in a tank like this. We do have it with a sponge filter, so there is some circulation and there's some water disturbance. So, you know, there's oxygen and there's flow. We also have some live plants in there for them too. So with these guys, you want to keep them in something at least 2.5, probably a five gallon is better. Yeah. The males cannot be kept with other males. They will fight each other. Uh -huh. um, there are a lot of different morphs too. If you take a look at here, we've got a giant. And he is quite a big boy. So he is a type of placat. Whereas you've got guys like these here, which are Dumbo ears. And they've got these very big, beautiful, fluttery pectoral fins and front fins, anal fins. Really cool little fish. Um, with all of the different morphs that are available right now, they can breed. Um, the females and the males will fight each other. So the female's a little more notorious. She will tear him up. But the males like to build these bubble nests. They will raise those eggs from a nest in bubbles. Oh. So once those eggs start to hatch, will he leave them, the fry will swim about, the fry are actually the baby fish, mm -hmm. and then the cycle happens again. So he's actually the good parent. The mom will eat them. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes they get eaten too. Oh. On yeah, this rack awesome. here, um, this is probably one of my favorite racks. Uh, okay. This is our epistogramma rack. And epistogrammas are a type of nano cichlid and there's all sorts you can get some from africa you can get some from south america some of the variations that you see here are south american so the pistogramma egazizii super red really cool little fish they've got quite personality too so if you're looking for something that's just like not a big cichlid but in a decent sized tank they've got great personality they'll readily breed for you as well the uh, cockatoides get these really beautiful mohawks as males and they get bright red and orange they're very flashy little fish and one of my favorites personally the fire reds are really gorgeous too these guys will actually get more color to them believe it or not that male's got a nice purple ridge fiery orange fins so the epistogrammas are also a really cool fish um, they'll readily spawn. You do want to keep them with caves or a little coconut hut and a densely planted take and they'll kind of establish their own little area there. And then that's where mom will raise them up, they'll lay eggs, dad will guard the area, but mom's a little more territorial. Sometimes she'll tell dad to buzz off, other mm. times it's okay. So pistos are a lot of fun. I always recommend them to a lot of people. Some oddballs here, the blind payfish. They're literally found in caves with zero light and they've evolved to have no eyes. Really, really alien, right? Mm -hmm. And then dragon goddies here. These guys are pretty freaky. Let's see if I can pull them out. We just got these in actually recently. And they're quite jumpy. Uh, 
Really cool looking fish, really weird looking face, but pretty popular in the hobby. And yeah. So, so we, uh, we like your mastics. I mean, I think they look really cool. This is not, I've never seen one look like this at all. This is amazing. Look how dark this is. Yeah, so this is a North African banded Um These are very rare, they're hard to come by. Um, I wow. think this is like, um, there's only a couple currently in Canada. I'm not sure about the States. I know that there's some over in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Wow, um, this is like melanistic how black this is, but then you got all this crazy bright orange. Yeah. I hope the camera's picking it up. This is unbelievable. The camera's picking it up perfect, actually. That's, that's great. Yeah. Thank you so much for showing us. This is like, oh, nice. man. Yeah. And these are these are something that they're not terribly hard to keep. Um, you have to make sure you you keep their environment, the humidity, and the temperatures correctly. But they're not terribly hard to keep. Um, you just got to make sure that you find the right breeders and the, the right stock, and that you're getting quality animals. So just like anything else. Um, but wow, what a beautiful animal. Skinks. So this is a red-eyed crocodile skink. They look like little dragons. They're semi-aquatic, so um, you have to have a really high humidity. Some people actually have a large portion of their enclosure in water. Um, but also you can do uh, some sphagnum moss and some soil, things like that, but you will really need to have a high humidity with them. So tell us, you know, like, why do you like keeping these? Like, what's cool about them? Oh, I don't personally keep these. You don't personally keep no, these? No, no, I, I don't personally I keep these. Um, <laughs> we just but, haven't done it yet. Yeah, um, but they are a really cool um, looking reptile. I think that's what draws a lot of people into buying them because yeah. they do look like a little dragon. Yeah, um, their so heads are just so yeah, cool. They're like they pointed have, with all the spikes. Yeah. They definitely have a unique look to them. Um, so and They can be yeah. runners yeah, and jumping. They, they, they have a tendency of being a bit skittish. Um, but they yeah. are very cool, like, Beautiful, man. They're just, they're great. Yeah. Little tiny dragons, how can you not beat them? And they're not terribly hard to keep. Uh, obviously with anything, you gotta make sure you do your research first, but great animal. So this is Nelson, and he's the owner, operator here, right? Yep. And um, how long have you been doing Tales and Scales? Tales and Scales in December had its 10th anniversary, so we're just over 10 years old. 10 years old, so, and how long have you been in like a, like a storefront like The this. storefront is 10 years old. Oh, the storefront. Tales and Scales is almost 30 years old. Well, 28 years old. That's, That's what I, I thought it was older, yeah. yeah. The store, brick and mortar store is 10 years old. Okay, and what, how did you start, like when you say like 25, 30 years, what were you starting as? Like you were just breeding animals? What were you doing? Basement breeder. Basement breeder. Yeah, like almost everybody in the hobby uh, started with some bearded dragons. Okay. Dwarf monitors and went from there. Dwarf monitors? What kind of dwarf monitors? Ackies, I didn't know that you did dwarf monitors. Hockey stores and uh, the boots back in the day. Yeah? I like Ackies, they're cool. <laughs> I, I mean, we like monitors. We're uh, looking maybe one day to be getting into some dwarf tree monitors, stuff like that. Awesome. Um, so, you've been doing it for a long time, you've been in the hobby for a long time, but now you got a brick and mortar store. What is the, what are the, some of the big things that you're like, it was a big learning for us when we first started brick and mortar store. Like, so one of the things that I would think about is we get tons and tons of questions from people that are like, don't buy from us or don't even know us. And they're just like, hey, you know, and so I'm constantly on the phone. I wish we were putting Ryan's phone number out there, but it's always me. Um, and so we get that. If we did a brick and mortar store, I think it'd be like times 10. Like you just, it'd be so many people coming in, which is good to share the, the ideas and the knowledge and stuff like that. Like I'm all for that, but it's also like can be headaches sometimes. Yeah, that happens a lot here where to the point where we feel like every other phone call is, hey, I want to buy this animal from this store. Can you tell me if it's a good store? Or can you tell me how to care for this animal? Or they said this, I don't know if it's right. Can I get your opinion? Yeah. And that happens a lot, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. And you know what, like you said, I don't mind doing it because if they're at least calling me, they keep calling me, eventually they'll come through my door. Yeah. At least you hope. Yeah, yeah. That's and then good. once they come through the door, I hope you keep them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That'd be good. <laughs> I think, um, Sometimes people look at the, obviously you have to have a business of it and you know, there's always the, the dichotomy of like, oh, what are, you, what are you doing that, you know, it's really the passion for the animals or and then the other side's like, oh, well, it's the business. And sometimes people are like, well, they can't coincide, but really the people that are successful at this really keep the, the balance because if you're doing it just as business, 
you lose the passion and it start being number games. But then if you're doing it just for the animals, you're like, man, I can't sell some of the stuff that I got. Or uh, so, like, what what drives you? Like, what's the passionate thing that you that drives you? So I'm still my number one passion is still the animals themselves. Hopefully, my tanks show that when you guys oh, are yeah, walking no, around. These are cool. Um, health is extremely important. Um, we do have a vet on call for the store. Yeah, and there's a hospital like <laughs> two doors down. Right. So, so we do have a, a, a reptile vet on call for the store. They come in, they check all of our animals. Um, we treat all of our animals as needed. Mm -hmm. uh, my vet bills get expensive. The vet bills don't always show in the price of the animal. Um, but if you sell a strong, healthy animal, it's a long-term pet, which means you're making all your money on food. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a good point. Like, feeders is where you make your money, let's be honest. Yeah. Supplies. So you want to get them with strong animals. And if you sell an animal that's weak, it passes away, they'll go somewhere else. Right. That's true. So you have to have a solid animal uh, to start. And if you have a solid animal, then all the residual sales is where the business part goes into play. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, it's something that we also think about is what long-term stuff you got. So obviously, like we were talking with MJ earlier about the tanks, even with the betta fish, like in a lot of places in the US and, and anywhere we go, you see them in smaller cups, cups because they that's they can handle it for a while, but maybe they're not as healthy. But uh, it just this takes up so much more space, but people aren't willing to to uh, make that sacrifice when they're trying to do the business, you know? And so you guys clearly are showing that, that you do care about the animals and that, you know, you got really good, strong stock and that for us, it's the same thing, you know. Like we want to make sure that the animals are eating and that they're right. they're doing well before we sell them to anybody, you know. And this is twofold. If you see the deli cup with the fish in it, the parents might not like it, or they might think that's the way to keep it, and it's not. Mm -hmm. If you show them this, they see it's in a tank, but still a small tank. This is doable. Mm -hmm. But then guess what? You just made another thirty, forty dollars. So now you sold a small tank, a little filter, and mm -hmm. there's the business part. Yeah, yeah. So not only is the animal healthy and happier. But there's the business part. Yeah, and then you also can do plants and stuff like that. Like sometimes people just put those little like glass beads in the bottom. Yeah. Maybe they'll put a fake plant. But you guys do a lot of live plants here, and uh, it's impressive, actually. So it's really cool what you guys got going on here. Well, thank you. So what's your your number one favorite animal? I mean, that's uh, the toughest question. I like, just gonna ask that. I don't know. Um, you're gonna laugh. Your mastics <laughs> and bearded dragons. <laughs> Bearded dragons because that's the first reptile I've ever kept, and your mastics okay. became my passion. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, like I was saying to you earlier, uh, when we got shown the your mastics that you guys got, <laughs> we're like, oh yeah, your mastics. I mean, they're cool, they're colorful. Yeah. We're like, then when we saw those two, we're like, yeah. like mind blown. So yeah, we want to rethink some <laughs> of that a little bit. But um, with bearded dragons, you know, they get a, a bad rap a little bit in the United States. People like them, but the pet. The pet market's like unbelievable for them. Right. So that's great. And they're a great business and stuff like that. But sometimes it's hard as a hobbyist to be really, really passionate about, you know, bearded dragons because there's so many around. Right. But um, doing it as like your first reptile, that's, I mean, obviously it's really cool to do. Um, so we really appreciate you uh, taking the time. My pleasure. And like I said, sorry for the typhoon or tornado we're getting ready for tomorrow's show <laughs> yeah yeah no we're gonna be at the show and we'll, we'll stop by and say Perfect. hi for sure thank so you. thank you so much so guys make sure you like this video comment below you know if you have any questions about some of the stuff you see here um and also hit the subscribe button the bell to make sure that you uh know when we're posting stuff and we'll put your information below in the description so if you guys are up in this area you can come visit thank but you. also you guys do online sales right for for yeah. some of your products and, and, and we ship to the u.s and they ship to the u.s hey imagine that all right, thanks guys. Do you want to do a shrimp? Is that because you're talking about the shrimp? I don't know anything about them. I just like them. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite part about this place? My favorite part about this place? The pork part? <laughs> um, what else here? We've got all sorts of the guppies too. Uh, live bearing fish in general are going to literally give birth to live fish, live baby fish. So these guys are fairly common in the hobby. They're full body albino or red guppies. And you can see the female there is not as colorful, but these guys get big, bright red, huge tails. And they'll literally give birth to live little fish. Really, really rewarding if you're just getting into the hobby and you're trying to play around with something.
That's super fun. Yeah, it's very cool. rewarding. Fish are fun because it's like, some people get real worried about like, oh man, handling your animals and all this other, but as long yeah. as you're maintaining the environment for the fish, they're like, <laughs> it could get in, it could get extensive, you know, like For the sure. hobby brings you down a wormhole. You got to know your water <laughs> chemistry. Next thing you know, you're building shelves and you're a carpenter, and then you got to yeah, figure out sure. plumbing. So now you're a plumber and electrical work, so on and so forth. But in the end, super rewarding. We have a friend that that's into fish, and he's just like, oh yeah, yeah, and he's also into reptiles. So yeah. we like hang out with him, and then he's like, oh yeah, I started out with like this one tank, and then it's like he just built all this stuff, and he's like, oh, I'm just. You can really go down the wormhole, just like you're saying. 15 tanks later. Yeah, yeah. 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 Just, <laughs> and reptiles and amphibians. That's awesome. Yeah. All right, well, thank it. you very much. No problem. That's great. Thanks for letting me thank chat you. yours off. Oh, anytime. <laughs> <laughs>